This is the CT scan of a patient with left-sided nasal polyps and allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. One can see hyperdensities in the ethmoidal sinus, both in anterior and posterior ethmoids, as well as the expansile part of the fungus that leads to expansion of the ethmoids on one side, which leads to telecanthus in the patient. The frontal sinus also shows hyperdense contents, which elaborates that almost all the sinuses on left side are involved with actual collection of this fungal mucin or debris. As we can see, there is considerable pressure on the orbit as well, with signs of focal erosion on the left side of lamina papyracea. As we go endoscopically inside the left side, we see that typical fungal mucin kind of picture, which is sometimes chalky and organized, while it is at sometimes it is a more thick fluid which is very mucinous in nature. A hallmark of this pathology is type 1 hypersensitivity with the increased serum Ig levels. One can also do fungal specific Ig levels if uh, one has to initiate uh, immunomodulators in these patients. The first portion is to uh, achieve some biopsy, some tissue of the polyps for histopathology that, that will help us in uh, eventual typing of the eosinophil counts inside the polyp, which is more important than mere uh, Ig levels. And once we have obtained enough tissue for both histopathology as well as KOH specimens for evaluating the type of fungus, one could also send a fungal culture in these patients. So they are not invasive generally, but uh, as a continuous spectrum, there is no harm in uh, obtaining adequate cultures. Uh, the spectrum of fungal disease from allergic fungal to uh, mycetoma to invasion is actually a continuous one and sometimes there are there have been instances where the same patient has exhibited more than two pathologies even on the same side. So whenever there is suspicion of a difference in tissue texture or tissue adherence to the surrounding bone or excessive erosion, there absolutely is no harm in, in obtaining that specific tissue, labeling it correctly and sending it to appropriate histopathology for finding signs of any possible fungal invasion. As you can see, we are, we are carefully not violating the middle turbinate. We, we, we prefer to maintain it till the very end as, a, as, a, as an important landmark. And first, we are grossly searing the polyp disease as well as the fungal part of it. This part initially is a little oozy and bleeds, which is okay. And the most important part here is to constantly irrigate the nasal cavity to keep uh, your scope from getting soiled up and uh, avoiding repeated ingress and outgress of the scope and avoiding any uh, time wastage. So as we are aware that the lamina papyracea is uh, focally dehiscent and pushed laterally in this patient, one has to be slightly cautious with the microdivider blade going laterally as to not inadvertently enter inside the orbit and uh, uh, start sucking the orbital fat. So at every point of time, whenever there is some doubt, one can obviously allot the orbit and check for the uh, approximation of the surgical instruments to the orbit. One very important point we have always emphasized that as before going towards the posterior ethmoid, one must uh, open the maxillary antrum as the maxillary antrum or the superior uh, uh, maxillary roof or the inferior orbital floor is, is a very vital guide point into both uh, entry into the posterior ethmoids as well as to the approximate level of sphenoid. So before we go into the sphenoid or before we complete the posterior ethmoidal dissection, generally it is recommended that we open the maxillary antrum relatively widely to be able to achieve a correct orientation for landmark purposes, to proceed in a safe way posteriorly without violating the uh, skull base. As we can note here, the expansion of the fungus uh, of the lamina papyracea laterally has, has led to a, a wide space on this side. And now, as, as I had remarked, before proceeding further, we, we, we progress to a uh, reasonably wide entrostomy. This is very important because this is a fungal disease. We need to have a, a pretty wide entrostomy here for 
good and adequate high volume irrigation in the post operative period using saline as well as uh, topical corticosteroids but also as i said uh, because the junction of the horizontal and and vertical uh, maxillary line which is the posterior and the superior part of the maxillary uh, entrostomy uh, also called as the transitional entrostomy ridge is a very very vital cue towards accessing the basal lamella and a very safe entry into the posterior ethmoids whereas the uh, orbital floor or the middle orbital floor being a very important landmark to locate the approximate level of the sphenoid sinus ostium now once we have the maxillary sinus in picture we could we we, we get a, a clear perspective of the level of skull base and the ethmoids and sphenoid and we can proceed further as you can see a lot of fungus is there in the entire ethmoids and we keep on clearing it at the same time as we as we clear some polyps bone chips must be carefully removed and it should be made 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 a point that the entire uh, lateral entry has to be made first wider for you to go more posterior or medial as we can see a lot of thick uh, mucin which is sort of partially organized is uh, is being removed from the posterior ethmoids now we we enlarge this entrostomy widely uh, and one can already see the level of the medial orbital floor which would guide us eventually towards the sphenoid sinus this is a very important mental navigation map that we must create and helps uh, both in primary surgeries with extensive disease such as this or in revision surgeries where there's already a loss of line marks so it has to be borne in mind that these 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 situations are always more oozy and bloody because there's a uh, widespread inflammation occlusion of ostia in these patients and uh, whenever we are denuding them moving the polyps and fungus they obviously bleed till the very end of surgery where most of the disease has been clearly removed as we see here gentle pressure on the lateral wall keeps on getting us more and more of this uh, trapped fungus and every bit of trapped fungal uh, antigens are to be removed to uh, successfully complete the surgery you can see the polyps from the which are major to the middle terminate now being sucked away in the microdivider blade at this point we are able to see the level of the uh, posterior lamina papyracea carefully as well as the skull base because uh, most of the anterior and posterior ethmoids have been removed and uh, the remaining septation will be taken down to create a smooth cavity which which can be which is amenable to high volume uh, irrigation for a long time to avoid recurrences now this is the posterior ethmoid cavity you can see a big cavity we have seen not enter its phenoid and now we'll see how how uh, quickly we can um, find the level of phenoid sinus in these situations from the level of the medial orbital floor which are which are always at the same level now to get access towards the uh, sphenoid and to make that as well amenable to high volume irrigation we use a, a true cut to resect the inferior third or sometimes even half of the middle turbinate to be able to give a good wide straight headshot access towards the sphenoid sinus because the goal is not just to open the sinus here but the goal is also to maintain its patency and uh, facilitate the uh, high volume irrigation in these patients which is uh, fundamental to avoiding recurrences and relapses of a fungal disease as we see the turbinate has been pedicle posteriorly and now uh, the sphenoid is being opened so in fairly one has to exercise caution because the presence of septal artery uh, without any need it must not be transected because that just leads to bis bleeding as well as devas devascularization of the septal mucosa 
So wherever possible, one can avoid it. But at the same time, the ostium has to be enlarged sufficiently for the uh, fungal disease of polyps to be cleared adequately, as well as, as I mentioned, facilitate the irrigation. As one can see, this phenoid sinus is mostly clean. The disease was essentially occupying only the ethmoids, both the anterior and posterior ethmoids, as well as the frontal sinus, which is yet to be open, some bit of the maxillary sinus as well. But the sphenoid per se appears to be reasonably clean. All the uh, sphenoid recesses, including the lateral recess, the pterygoid recess, must be carefully examined for any evidence of fungal infection because the fungal infection remains here. It's always going to come back and uh, cause complications. So we can use a bone punch, we can use even a drill uh, or a um, sphenoid also opening mushroom forceps to enlarge the opening of the sphenoid. Now once that has been done and we have seen that that is pretty much clear, we focus our attention towards the frontal sinuses which we saw clearly uh, was occupied with actual fungal muck and not just a uh, sinusitis. Then the fungal disease from uh, the frontal sinus is very, very important because uh, disease that remains here can uh, and will always cause eventually uh, erosion of the orbital walls as well as frontal bossing and can lead to expansion of the frontal sinus, proptosis, which is, which is uh, a very, very morbid condition. You can see here how the frontal recess has been opened and uh, the thick, semi-organized or partially organized fungal muck uh, starts to appear. We wait not open the frontal sinus per se, but the recess is now being opened. So a suction or a non-suction uh, uh, frontal sinus curette is used for uh, back fracturing of the frontal cells. It could be one, two, or three configuration. This is a very safe method of uh, uh, enlarging the frontal opening because we are doing a back fracture and there's very little risk of damaging the olfactory fossa or the skull base here. So we can see here that, the, that the, there's a cell behind and the frontal sinus is in front of that cell. That cell could very well be a supra-bullar cell which pneumatizes behind the frontal sinus as you see here. And now we shift to an angled endoscope that is 70 degrees for a better visualization of the frontal recess and the sinus. The frontal sinus is being accessed now which is full of disease as well as the cell behind the frontal recess as you see is, is relatively clean. One must bear in mind that the goal is not just to suction and get this clear, but also create some sense of reasonable opening, which, it's, which is amenable to generous irrigation to prevent any recurrence. As we go here with, the, with an angled scope, inside now the frontal sinus itself per se, we can see the disease going quite inside the frontal sinus. We are following the frontal beak, as you see, and now with the suction, we are slowly but progressively getting this fungal muck out which if remains here is, uh, is a cause for uh, early recurrence as well as orbital complications. So looking up with a 7 degree endoscope camera, we are using the frontal sinus suction, curved suction upwards to uh, conclusively clear the frontal sinus itself. And now that we see it, mostly it is. And we can also see the level of the frontal beak behind which there is the frontal sinus. There is some edematous mucosa, which we can probably leave. And uh, some amount of septations we are able to clear with the help of a uh, upward curved uh, forward through cutting forceps.
the last piece of cell here which was remaining has been removed and now we can see a relatively wide opening inside the frontal sinus in this patient which is very much flush with the level of the uh, anterior skull base now what remains is just the last bit of cells uh, which are adhering to the lavina papyracea which are being removed with the microdivided blade taking care not to uh, uh, Unsure the orbit. You use a gentle pressure with the uh, micro divider blade, which is of course switched off, to see if there's any fungal mucin or debris trapped inside any cell here. If that is so, it should probably exude out, which is very important. As you can see, there's still some fungal mucin trapped inside cells, which is coming out with slight pressure. This is again a very frequent site of recurrence of disease. If small amount of fungal antigen is left, there is a fair possibility because it is trapped that it uh, starts to expand and erode the uh, lamina papyracea and the orbit in this location and may also lead to abscesses. So now most of it appears to have completed. The sinuses are mostly clean. You can see a, a wide opening of the maxillary sinus, the sphenoid sinus. The sphenoid is pretty much clean, it does not have much disease. Some bare bone chips are there which have to be cleaned and the frontal sinus uh, and the recess is, is widely opened as we can see here flush with the posterior skull base and uh, lamina papyracea is, is carefully visible it's clean now with no evidence of any fungus uh, or any mucinous component still trapped inside and the ethmoidal septation is mostly taken down now a coblation wand is being used to just uh, coagulate the, the posterior end of the middle turbinate which has been resected, the inferior half because this end has the artery toward the middle turbinate from the septal branch from the single palatine artery which often bleeds so before we can close this because we, we do not intend to pack these patients these patients are supposed to breathe and start irrigating immediately so hemostasis is very important so we just also use in the end a small sheet of surgicel over the posterior margin of the mesley and trust me and also a portion of it covers the stump of the excised uh, middle turbinate inferior hub so that there is uh, absolutely no bleeding concerns in the post-operative period. No packing is required.